So we're kicking off the tutorials, and the first one is uh, Ben Rossman. It's uh, a take off on uh, all beams of Shingle Primer. Okay, thanks. So welcome everybody. Uh, glad everyone could be here. Um, yes. Yeah, so as, as Rahul notes, this the title of this talk is an homage to Paul Beam's excellent survey, uh, uh, switching lemma primer. So here's the outline of the talk. Uh, so it will be in two parts. Um, the first part of the talk, I'll, I'll start off by covering the very basic concepts. So the models of computation we'll be discussing: AC zero circuits. DNFs and CNFs and decision trees, then uh, random restrictions. Then I'll present the, the classic switching lemma of Hustad. Um, we'll also see a proof of it. And how I'll show how the switching lemma is used to prove um, lower bounds for the parity function. And in the second part of the talk, I'll be discussing um, some new work. Um, so joint work with Tony Patassi, Rocco Cervedio, and Liang Tan. Um, so uh, the, the main result there is a uh, switching lemma appropriate to uh, the Cyton tautologies on expander graphs, but I'll be discussing, presenting this in a much more general um, and, and more elementary way uh, uh, in terms of a switching lemma for affine subset restrictions. So that will be the second part of the talk. All right, so let's get started. Um, so let's review the uh, basic models of computation should be familiar to most people, but let's, let's go through it anyway. Um, and the most critical notion here will be that of a, the canonical decision tree associated with a DNF or a CNF formula. And feel free to interrupt me with questions at any point. Okay, so um, AC0 circuits um, are Boolean circuits with unbounded fan and, and, and OR gates. Um, in this case, we can sort of assume without loss of generality that they're nicely, you know, layered uh, like this, and we have negations at the uh, without loss of generality at the level at the uh, input level. Okay, so the inputs are labeled by variables or, or their negations. Okay, and the sort of uh, two main parameters of circuits uh, are the size, by which we refer to the number of gates in the circuit and the depth, which is the number of layers of gates. So in this case, this would be depth four circuit. Okay? And um, AC0 itself, a as a complexity class, refers to sequences of Boolean functions which are computable by polynomial size constant depth circuits. Okay? So um, a special case is the depth two case. So this is uh, also known as DNFs and CNFs. So DNF for disjunctive normal form formulas and CNF for, for conjunctive. So a DNF is just an OR of ANDs as depicted here. Um, and the width of a DNF or CNF is the maximum number of variables in a term or clause. Okay, and we write K, K DNF for width K DNF. So, uh, so as depicted here we have an OR gate with unbounded fan in, um, which, which receives AND gates of ANDs of at most K literals, so variables or negated variables. So, oh, um, okay, so another important <coughs> model of computation for this talk will be decision trees. Um, here shown by example, so how, 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 what function does this compute? You read, you start at the top, you read variable X3, and you branch left or right depending on its value and so on. And at the, bo the bottom here, the leaves are giving the output values. Okay, so this is a decision tree. The depth of a decision tree is the maximum number of variables read on any path. So in this case, this is a depth three decision tree. Okay, um, and the, you know, the same variable can appear on different branches, but you know, we assume you don't need to read the same variable twice on any branch. Okay, so decision trees give uh, a, a natural complexity measure on Boolean functions. So if we have an n variable Boolean function f, then its decision tree depth, denoted dt depth, is the minimum depth of a decision tree that computes f. Okay, so let's see some uh, examples. The, the parity function on n variables. So you're given a, a string of length n is the su um, sum of its values uh, even or odd. 
Uh, and the n variable and function, well, it's easy to show that these both have decision tree depth n. So in the worst case, you need to read all n variables in order to compute the function. Um, and what does it mean to have decision tree depth zero? It just means that you're a constant function, okay? So um, there's, a, there's sort of a relationship between decision trees and DNF and CNF formulas. So every, every width k, or every depth k decision tree uh, can be converted to a k DNF as well as a k CNF. So let's just see how that works. Um, so in, in this case, this, this decision tree here would be giving this DNF and simply you, you look at all of the one outputs, all the one branches in the, um, in the decision tree and you just take a conjunction of the, of the, um, you know, the, the, the clauses that correspond to it. So hopefully this is pretty clear and you can do the same thing with ANDs. So can you go back one second? So dt depth is the minimum depth of a decision tree. So over all possible decision trees that can be done. Exactly. Yeah. Then why is parity not log n? Um, well, you can par compute parity over uh, first n over half over n variable, ah. and then write half over. Right, because the query the queries are are variables. Uh, yeah. yeah so course. the yeah. Um, the AC zero depth of parity yeah. would be like log n. Okay. So so here's now we come to the first sort of very critical notion. So that of a, the canonical decision tree associated with a DNF. Okay. So here here's an example of a DNF. Uh, I've colored the clauses to make this easier to see what's going on. Um, so what's the canonical decision tree corresponding to this DNF? Okay. And I'm, I'll um, I won't write the ands just to reduce clutter here. Okay, so we're going to go clause by clause. We'll start with the first clause, x1 and x2 and x3, and we can write this as a decision tree like this. Okay, and we're, con you know, so the dots here mean we're going to continue the process somehow. Of course, if you read all three of these variables, if they're all one, then we output a one. So the, so the decision tree terminates here with a one, and now we keep going. So we could similarly build a decision tree just for this clause that would look like this here. And in building the canonical decision tree, we can kind of append this below each of the, uh, you know, at, at each of the previous uh, ellipsi, ellipsis places. And um, we note that we never need to read the same variable twice along a branch. So in this case, um, we We've already read x2 here. Its value was well, whatever was was uh, zero, so that we can skip, we can bypass reading this gate and like that. And then finally, we would just simplify by trimming the redundant um, nodes. Okay, so hopefully this is pretty uh, clear. And then yeah, so this process would continue. Okay, and at at the end, we've we have some ones in some places and. Everywhere that hasn't received a one, we put a zero. So the, okay, and so hopefully it's clear that this, this, this process is giving a, a decision tree which computes the same function as this DNF. Okay, and okay, I'll sort of come back to this later in the talk. Okay, so the next critical notion we need to discuss the switching lemma is the notion of a restriction. Okay, so restriction, uh, for now, we'll mean the same thing as a, as a, a map from, from variables or the variable indices to zero, one star. And restrictions are also corresponding to subcubes of the, of the Hamming cube. Okay, so these are all the same notion. Uh, okay, so um, consider a Boolean function f of n variables. So a restriction with respect to the variables of f or an n variable restriction. Okay, so formally we'll define it as a function um, th this capital R here from the, the variables or, or variable indices to zero, one star. Okay, uh, right, so we've, we identify n with, the, with variables x1 to xn. Um, R assigning variable i to zero or one just means we're, we're fixing the variable xi to zero or one. And we think of star as, as be, me, meaning free or unrestricted. Okay. Um, so, if we have a Boolean function and a restriction, we can apply the restriction R 
to f, and we get a new Boolean function, and, that, and denoted this f harpoon r, and its variables are the stars of r. And this is defined in the, in the, very, in the natural way. So let's say our restriction looks like this. So if we want to evaluate um, uh, f harpoon r, then you know, it, it's evaluated on settings of the stars, and its value is equal to f of, well, you just, you just combine these two things and you get an n variable string. So hopefully everyone's just terribly bored at this point, but things will pick up. Um, okay, so, so that's how restriction is applied to a Boolean function. We also want to view restrictions as um, syntactic operators on our uh, models of computation. So we can apply a, a restriction syntactically to a circuit or to a DNF or to a decision tree. So let's review how that works. Um, okay, so first let's look at what it means to apply a restriction to a circuit. Um, and let's just for simplicity consider the restriction R which just maps the variable x1 to 1 and everything else is a star. So um, so that you would just substitute zero, you know, one um, for the positive instances of x1, zero for the negative instances of, of x1. Um, okay, that lets us evaluate this OR gate to one, and then we can, we can eliminate these wires as well, and sort of remove them from the circuit. Okay? Um, you could define this a bit more formally, but this, this uh, um, applying restrictions like this, one variable at a time, to circuits, um, this is essentially what's known as the gate elimination method. Um, this plays a role in these, uh, in these linear, you know, 3N uh, type lower bounds for un unbounded depth Boolean circuits. You can also apply uh, restrictions deterministically to get slightly superlinear lower bounds against bounded depth circuits. So I just wanted to mention this result before we talk about random restrictions. Uh, in, in a nice paper of Choudhury and Radhakrishnan, they give slightly superlinear lower bounds for depth D circuits <coughs> via... You know. Okay, so uh, now what does it mean to apply a restriction to a DNF formula? It's going to be very similar. So here's a DNF formula and let's just take our example um, R being the restriction mapping X1 to 1 and X4 to 0. So what do you do? Okay, you substitute for the, for the literals and every clause which gets any a zero value we can just eliminate. And then in the surviving clauses, any, any literal which gets a one value, we can just eliminate. Okay, and then so to apply this restriction to this DNF, we would, we would simplify like this. So hopefully everything's clear so far. Okay, and um, finally, what does it mean to apply a restriction to a decision tree? So again, by example, we'll just consider the restriction which sets x1 to 1 and leaves everything else unrestricted. Um, so here there's two occurrences of x1 in this decision tree. So by setting x1 to 1, we're sort of bypassing this, the, you know, the, the zero subtree below here. Um, so we can just eliminate that and, and simplify in the natural way. Okay. Uh, good. So now we come to... Uh, so we're going to be looking at random restrictions. So, um, and in, throughout this talk, um, random objects are going to be uh, represented in boldface consistently throughout the talk. Okay, so this boldface R sub P, let's define it. So P here and throughout the talk will be some, some parameter between zero and one, some probability. And RP is the random restriction uh, where for each independently, for each variable i, we leave it unrestricted with probability p, and we set it otherwise to 0 or 1 with equal probability, so 1 minus p over 2. Okay, and this is the most, uh, uh, the most common model of random restrictions. Okay, so um, by l seeing what effect this uh, random restriction RP has on Boolean functions on the one hand and, uh, and on our models of computation on the other hand, we're able to show lower bounds. So, um, yeah, so on the one hand, uh, this RP simplifies certain um, models, you know, small decision trees, AC0 circuits, De Morgan formulas, um, and this is a, you know, well, for, for De Morgan formulas, this is a line of work going back to Subodoskaya. 
Um, whereas on the other hand, for certain Boolean functions, like the parity function, are sort of resilient to random restrictions and they maintain high complexity under the random restriction. So by, by combining these, these two ideas, we get lower bounds. Okay, so let's first look at the effect that this random restriction RP has on some very simple Boolean functions. So, okay, so for the, the, the AND function of N variables, for example, a random restriction RP will, will completely kill the AND function. We'll set it to zero, the constant zero, with high probability, say, if P is less than one half. Okay, this is very easy to see. Right, so on the other hand, if I have any restriction R, which has K stars, and I apply it to the parity function, then what I get back is either a parity function on, on the K variables or the negation of a parity function. This is easy to see. Okay, so the consequence of this is, in particular, if we hit the parity function, N variable parity function with this random restriction RP, what we get back will have decision tree depth very close to p times n with high probability. Okay? So in this sense, you know, the parity function remains complex with respect to decision tree depth under the random restriction RP. Okay, so now let's get to the uh, more, uh, yeah, more interesting observation. What effect does the random restriction RP have on decision trees? So this is, yeah, we can now state our first uh, switching lemma. This is, will be more elementary than the Hastad switching lemma, but we're going to come back to this in the second half of the talk. So, okay, we'll call this the decision tree switching lemma. If T is a depth K decision tree, and we hit it with a random restriction RP, then the probability that its depth is bigger than L is at most this here, 2 PK to the L. Okay? Um, in fact, you can prove somewhat sharper bounds than this, but... Um, and in the kind of range of parameters people use, typically we would set P something like 1 over 4K, so that this is, think of this here, this bound as being exponentially decaying in L. Okay? So I'm gonna... Well, we're gonna see a particular proof of this decision to switching them in the second half of the talk. Um, but I want to... Yeah, put this side by side now with Hastad switching lemma. So the, the effect that RP has on KDNFs. So note that a, a KDNF is, is, really, is the same thing, the same, the same class of functions as an unbounded fin, an, an OR of arbitrarily many depth K decision trees. Okay, and what Hastad switching lemma sa states is that if F is a KDNF, then we get a very similar bound on the decision tree depth of F under the random restriction RP. So, so the effect RP has on a single depth K decision tree or on an OR of ar uh, ar on arbitrarily many depth K decision trees is similar. Okay, so here this, you know, if P is less than say 1 over 10K, then this is uh, exponentially decaying in L. Okay, so, um, okay, and so we're going to see a proof of, of, of Hastad switching lemma and we'll see how it's applied to get lower bounds for the parity function. Okay, and uh, I should mention that this isn't... Uh, okay, well, I guess this is uh, a common way to state the switching lemma, but maybe the, the original statement of the switching lemma, um, you can... So this is a, cor a direct corollary. If F is a KDNF, then you could also say that you're getting a bound on the probability that F restricted on RP is not equivalent to an LCNF. Because, um, I mean, if your decision tree depth is bigger than L, then you're not equivalent... Then, uh, or I guess it's the other way around. If you're equivalent to an LCNF, then your decision tree depth is at most L. Okay, and um, I've been talking about DNFs, but everything I say about DNFs is completely dual for CNF. So if we just exchange the roles of AND and OR, then we get exactly the same results, okay? Um, okay, and just, uh, just to, to illustrate the, the uh, switching lemma by a picture, uh, so we start off with a KDNF, we hit it with the random restriction RP for some suitably small P, and we get, uh, we, we get an LCNF with high probability. Okay, any questions uh, so far at this point? I, I, didn't, I didn't understand this. So, so you, you're saying you, hit, you set some of the bits to zeros or ones? Yep. 
um, it seems magical to me that you, know, you can conclude this. Yes, it's, it's, it is. It's rather magical to me. Uh, yeah, but we'll see. We'll see a proof. So. Okay. So yeah. Explain yeah. So um, yeah. Before get, before yes, looking at the proof, how the switching lemma is proved. Let's see how it's used first of all. So so this can be used in a very natural way now for a kind of depth reduction argument. Um, so here's the idea. So we have uh, an AC zero circuit in this case, I guess depth four circuit with uh, bottom fan in K. Okay. Um, then, well, uh, we can apply the switching lemma to each gate, and so we're going to hit the whole circuit with a random restriction RP, and we can apply the switching lemma uh, to each second level AND gate here in this circuit, um, and sort of just take a union bound over the failure probabilities. Okay, and in this way we, we're able to switch to um, an OR of fan and L, and now we have in our circuit two consecutive layers of OR gates. But these can of course be combined into, into since we don't care about the fan and above the bottom layer, this can be just combined into OR gates. And now we can, we can continue the process. So this is the one step in the depth reduction argument that, that you get using the switching lemma. Okay, so this is the picture here. So there's an alternative way to view this, this same argument in terms of decision trees. And I'm going to now sort of shift to that for the rest of the talk. Oh, and just to mention, so typically in these arguments you set K and L to be the same roughly N to the 1 over D. This is sort of setting in the parity lower bound. Okay, so we can also view this in terms of decision trees and this is the, this will be the preferred view for the rest of the talk. So now the picture is, we imagine we have our AC0 circuit sitting on top of a layer of depth K decision trees. And now by, uh, by applying this sort of decision tree version of, the, of Hostad's switching lemma, we can, um, you know, we have an and of, of, ar of arbitrarily many depth K decision trees, so it becomes a depth L decision tree with high probability. And okay, so the picture just looks like this now. Okay, this is the same argument essentially, but... Um, okay. Good, so let's now see how uh, this depth reduction argument is used to prove lower bounds for the parity function. Okay, so this is the, the, the corollary of, uh, of, the, of the switching lemma that's in, in Hostad's thesis. I should, I should mention, uh, so there were earlier lower bounds for the parity function showing that parity is not in the class AC0. This was shown by Aitai and first Sack Sipser, um, and, and there were some uh, improvements by Yao, and then uh, uh, Johan gave the sort of tight bound. Um, okay, yeah, so, the, the, so the, the lower bound is that depth d plus 1 circuits for parity require size exponential in omega n to the 1 over d. Yeah? You're going to use the uh, decision tree only to compute CNFs or KCNF or DNF? Are you going to Boolean functions? Um, well, I, so f I think for the rest of the talk, uh, I'll, I'll be focused on just decision, this, this decision tree version. So we kind of the model of computation, really think of it as AC0 circuits on top of small depth decision trees. Which is supposed to be KCM or KDM. Um, it will be equivalent. Uh, okay, ho hopefully it will be clear if there's a... Okay, so... The, well, before presenting lower bounds, if, if, it's, if it's easy enough, I like to show the upper bound. So let me just show that this, this is actually uh, completely tight. Okay, and this is just a recursive construction of, uh, of circuits computing the parity function. So just to show briefly, so the, the depth 2 case is just sort of brute force exponential size circuit. And, um, and then there's a, a sort of recursive construction. Um, so for depth d plus 1, you have a brute force depth 2 circuit computing parity on n to the 1 over d variables and you compose this with depth d circuits um, computing parity on um, disjoint blocks of n to the 1 minus 1 over d uh, variables um, and you can a key point is that you can for you can represent these both as as circuits with top fan and and as well as with top fan and or okay and so we could have the 
bo bottom fan in here are OR gates, the top fan in here are OR gates, and then we can combine them and, and the depth only increases by one. Okay, so just to, just to point that out, that the lower bound is tight. Okay, so how, so we'll sort of see pictorially how does the depth reduction uh, argument now work for the parity function. So we have our variable, so just consider any AC0 circuit and at the, at the, our inputs are just variables or their negations. So in particular we'll just view it as a layer of depth one decision trees on n variables. Okay, now we can apply our, we, our first RP random restriction for some P which, to be determined. Um, we'll denote this row one um, on, the, on the n variables and applying the switching lemma to each bottom level gate, taking union bound, what we get are um, with high probability a family of low depth decision trees. Now on p times n variables, we've gone from n variables to p, p n variables. And what, what exactly does low depth mean? Well, um, <coughs> for an appropriate choice of p what we get is that almost all of the of these guys have depth zero. They're, they're fixed to constant zero or one. Some epsilon fraction will have depth one. Epsilon squared fraction will have depth two and so on. Okay? So the, the maximum depth among all these guys will be will be uh, relatively small. Okay? So this is this is uh, what low depth means. And now we can just repeat this argument. Um, but now um, so the, the, the surviving variables, we don't have all n variables, but the surviving variables correspond to the stars of row one. And now we sample uh, a, a random restriction row two with the same, you know, the same, um, you know, star probability p. Um, and we can again apply this restriction to, to the new bottom level uh, gates and, and so on. So now we have low depth decision trees on p squared n variables. And if you repeat this process uh, d times, then what we get is a low depth decision tree, and in fact almost surely a depth zero decision tree, so a constant function, um, on, on uh, p to the fourth n variables, or p to the depth times n variables. Okay? Now, alright, so in other words the output of the circuit gets completely fixed to zero one, after when, you know, on the composition of these restrictions, which is just equal to a single restriction with star probability p to the fourth. Okay? Now, so long as the number of surviving variables is, you know, uh, bigger than one, this argument would show that the original circuit did not compute the parity function. Right? Because we, we noted before, if you hit the parity function with, with any restriction which has any surviving variables, you get you get uh, a non-trivial function, whereas this argument showing that almost surely we're getting a, a constant function uh, if our circuit is sufficiently small. Okay, so this is a bit hand wavy, um, and if you work out the sort of optimal setting of parameters in this argument, you can get this um, exponential in omega n to the one over d lower bound for depth d plus one circuits. Okay, so probably most people have seen this before. Um, Okay, good. So, yeah, so next I'll, I'll tell you about a more recent work uh, that's showing how you can get an even better lower bound for in the setting of depth d plus one formulas, okay? Um, so this will be a bit hand wavy, but I just gives a different perspective of random restrictions um, and a different way to use the uh, Hostad switching lemma. So I thought I'd, I'd uh, attempt to show it, okay? All right, so Okay, so this is our picture of AC0 circuits. So a formula is a, is a tree-like circuit. So by AC0 formulas we just mean sort of AC0 circuits with fan out one. Okay? Um, so tree-like circuits. So um, a key factor relating depth D circuits and depth D formulas. So if, if every depth D plus one circuit of some size S can be converted to a depth d plus one formula <coughs> whose size is at most s to the d. So you, there's some, some blow up. And this is done simply, I mean, if, if, I, if I have a circuit for any gate in the circuit which has overlapping sub-circuits, I would just make disjoint copies. And I have to do this at, at you know, you know for, for, for each, each of the d layers above the first layer, and this, this is what gives the blow up in the worst case. 
Okay? So the natural question is whether this kind of, this kind of blow up is, is in fact necessary or is there a better way in general to simulate um, circuits by formulas. Okay, so, so this was the Hostad's bound for circuits and uh, what I was able to show in, in recent work is that if you look at formulas of depth d plus one computing the parity function, you get a stronger lower bound. So there's an extra d factor here in the exponent. So it's exponential in d times n to the one over d. Okay, so this looks, well, it, this is a fairly minor uh, improvement for small depths d. But what's interesting about this is that it shows, uh, it gives a better depth lower bound. So a corollary of this, of Hosta's lower bound for size, the size depth trade-off, is that if you want polynomial size circuits for parity, then you're getting a lower bound uh, up to depth log n over log log n. Okay, this is, and, and, and this, is, this is tight. But if you look at formulas with unbounded fan and of course, then we can uh, get a better lower bound all the way up to omega log n. Okay, so this, this stronger bound for formulas is pushing the, pushing the kind of frontier right to the threshold of NC1. Okay, so let me say something a little bit about how this, how this, uh, how this argument works. Um, so it's based on an alternative view of the random restriction RP. So this number one here is the, this was the, the way I defined RP originally, but now let's generate RP by a, by a, yeah? When you talk about formulas, these are uh, Fanning 2? Oh no, unbounded Fanning, unbounded Fanning, yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to generate RP um, by independently sampling uh, a uniform random assignment to all variables, so some sigma in 0, 1 to the n, and independently for each variable, we take a random timestamp, so a random real number uniformly distributed in the, in the interval 0, 1. And now we can define the RP of variable i to be star, so, uh, so unrestricted, if the timestamp is less than p. And otherwise, we set it to sigma i, okay? And it's, uh, it's easy to see that this is a, you know, this, these two distributions are exactly the same. Okay, but this, this uh, so here's the picture of this. So we can now kind of view this as a, um, as a family of distributions as p goes from one to zero. Let me just kind of try to illustrate that. So here we have the interval zero, one. So here's our random assignment and, and here are the timestamps for each variable. So, and here I think of time, this parameter p as a, as a countdown time. So it starts at one and it's gonna sort of continuously go down to zero. So at the initial time, p equals one, then our, the restriction rp is just all stars. So, uh, you know, we haven't revealed any of the variables yet. Okay, so, yeah, we, we don't see anything. Um, let's say at time 0.99, maybe the first variable is, is revealed. Okay, at time one half, then, you know, we'd expect roughly half the variables are, are revealed and eventually all at the you know, end of times p0, rp is the same as our, as our random string. <coughs> okay, uh, so now let's illustrate uh, the depth reduction argument that we saw already for AC0 circuits. <coughs> so what we did is we hit the first layer of our circuit with the restriction rp, so at time p, and now we, you know, before I said we were kind of composing random restrictions, but now we can view this differently as we're just sort of, we're just lowering the bar, we're re revealing more variables. So we, you know, we now evaluate the circuit at time p squared and so on. Okay, so, uh, so this was the picture of the previous depth reduction argument. And the point about this is that this parameter p was something which was fixed in terms of the circuit size and the circuit depth. Uh, so this is sort of, the p itself is non-adaptive in this argument. Okay, so to get better lower bounds for formulas, we're going to do things a little bit differently. So now here we have a picture of a formula. And um, so here's the key idea behind the, the stronger lower bound for formulas. Um, we're going, for each sub-formula here, uh, we're going to assign it its own stopping time. 
Okay? This stopping time denoted this bold face Q of F. And this is going to be a random variable that takes a value between 0 and 1. Okay, and it's going to be completely determined by this sigma and tau. So the only randomness in this argument comes from this random assignment sigma and this timestamp tau. And this, this will determine a stopping time for each Boolean formula. <coughs> okay, um, so I'll kind of show how that's defined. So the definition is inductive. It's going to be a bottom-up definition. So, okay, so let's see. So this, this subformula G, it has some stopping time. Its siblings might now have different stopping times. In the previous argument, we evaluated all of these guys sort of at time, you know, whatever, p to the depth. But now here, they're each getting their own stopping time. So now how do we now define the stopping time of f, given the stopping times of its children? So it will always be below the stopping times of its children, and um, it's defined uh, in the following way. Don't really worry about this definition because I'm not going to be getting, getting into the proof or anything, but just to show you. Um, so if we want to define the stopping time at a, at a gate here, we take the minimum stopping time of the children, so this I'll denote by p, and then I hit all of these children with the random restriction at time p. And what I get are a bunch of decision trees, and I, a priori I don't know what the depth of these decision trees are. But now I let k be the maximum depth of the decision trees that I, that I get below here. And now the new stopping, t the stopping time of f is defined as this p over 14k. So this is, this is how the, this, this definition works. Um, okay, and the, the point of this definition is that it lets us restate the, the Hastad switching lemma um, in terms of stopping times. So, so the switching lemma says, you know, we have a KDNF or KCNF, so if I hit that F with a random restriction, and here I'm fixing the particular P, 1 over 14K, then I get a bound which is exponential uh, in, in L. And so what this, this definition of the stopping time um, is kind of, it was engineered to satisfy the following property, that for every Boolean formula F whatsoever, if we hit F with the restriction at the stopping time of F, then we get exactly this bound. Okay, and this, this stopping time version of the switching lemma is in fact, I mean, we prove it by reduction to Hosted switching lemma. It's sort of built into the definition of the... Okay, and so, and just to say very briefly how this leads to better lower bounds, so the, the sort of technical um, lemma that we need is a tail bound on the stopping, on, on this uh, random variable, the stopping time at a, at a given formula, in terms of the size and the depth of the formula. Okay, so... Can this be a formula on the previous slide? No, everything I've defined, you know, well, circuit, uh, you know, this is well defined for circuit, you would just define it in terms of the formula. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's crucial here that this size is the formula size of F. Yeah, so this is the first point actually at which the distinction is important. So don't try, don't try to parse this, uh, it's not important. Um, I did, however, want to flash this constant C. Uh, so, the, so there's some crazy constant in this proof, and this is corresponding, in fact, to some, um, some partitioning of the, of, the, of the bad event. So like, whereas before we had just a union bound over gates, now we have a more complicated uh, uh, partition of, this, of the space of bad events. Okay, anyway, the, once you have this, this, uh, this main lemma together with the, the stopping time version of the switching lemma, it's easy to derive the, as a corollary the, the lower bound for, for uh, formulas for computing parity. Okay? So, okay, so I just wanted to, to uh, show that there are, uh, you know, there are other ways to use the, just the standard switching lemma than the, stan than the you know, traditional bottom-up depth reduction argument. So. <coughs> okay, good. So, um, yeah, so the, in the remaining uh, 15 minutes or so of this first half of the talk, uh, I wanted to show a bit about um, how the proof of the original Hastad switching lemma goes. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to give a, uh, a simpler proof of a weaker version of Hastad switching lemma. Okay, but I'm going to show how this generalizes um, in, a, in, a, in a useful way. Okay, so first let's see the, the proof of Hastad switching lemma. 
Um, and if you get lost here, um, it won't be really important for the second half of the talk, but I, I, I did want to show this. Okay, so, um, okay, so we fix a KDNF formula F and a parameter L, okay? So the statement of the of Hastad switching lemma, well, so the, the way I phrased it before is that the probability that the decision tree depth of F restricted on R being at least L is some order PK to the L. But what the switching lemma actually shows is something stronger. It shows that, well, let's look at a particular um, decision tree for, for F on row. We're going to construct the canonical decision tree of F restricted on RP and look at the depth of that and show that, the, and show that that has small depth. Therefore, the decision tree depth of, of F is small. So this is a stronger statement than, than what I had before. Isn't there a constant inside the parentheses? What's that? Is there a constant inside the parentheses? I mean, auto, you mean well, auto PK to hold the parallel? Yeah, well, or, yeah, the, the O would ha ha include the constant, right? It's, it's a hold to the power, I guess. It's, it's oh, yeah, yeah, I see, yes. Yeah. Okay, so here's how the... Uh, well, I'm going to just rephrase this now. So I'm going to let bad here is going to be the set of bad restrictions. So restrictions are which violate, the, which violate this uh, event here. Or, or, or sorry, which, well this is the bad event, so its restrictions are such that the depth of the canonical decision tree of F on R is bigger than L. And so the goal is to show that the probability that the random restriction RP is in this bad set is order PK to the L. So this is exactly, so I mean, this, this goal is exactly the switching lemma. Okay? So here's how this, how this works. So the key idea is to associate each bad restriction R with an extension of, of uh, denoted R star here, okay, which has two properties. So R, this R star is going to have L fewer stars. So what we're going to be doing is taking R and filling in um, L of its stars to zero or one. Okay, so that's the first property of this, uh, of this map. So in particular, a consequence of this is that um, we get, if we look at the probability um, that this RP equals R star, it, it's uh, going to be greater than the probability that RP is equal to R by precisely this, uh, this here. So recall that, I mean, what's the definition of RP? So for any restriction rho which has S stars, its weight under, under RP is exactly P to the S, whoops, there's a missing two here, times um, one, one minus P over two to the N minus S. So if we're filling in L stars, then we get a, we a weight increase of one minus P over two P to the L. Okay, so, and the second property of this map is that it's going to be bounded many to one. Okay, so in particular for each bad restriction R, um, there's going to be at most 4k to the L different, uh, so for each, for each possible value of R star, there's going to be at most 4k to the L different R which map to it. Okay, so this is a, let me show you how these, these two properties uh, are enough to give the switching lemma. Uh, okay, so, okay, so here's the, the derivation. So we want to bound this probability that the probability that RP is bad. So, okay, let's just, we can write this as a sum over every particular bad restriction that the, the probability that RP equals that guy. And now we're using this, this uh, weight increase property. Oops. So, uh, so the probability that RP is equal to R is exactly you know, 2P over one minus p to the l times the probability that rp equals r star. All right, and now let, we can just say that uh, without loss of generality, p is at most one half. So we, we can just write this as four p to the l, or bound this by four p to the l. All right, and now we're so we're looking at the probability that that we're summing over bad r and looking at the probability that rp equals r star. And now we use the fact that 
that this map is uh, 4k to the l to 1. So we can rewrite, you know, we get we can rewrite this now as 4k to the l times the probability that rp is in the set of r star where r is a bad restriction. And now we just use a, a very elementary fact that the probability of anything is at most 1. All right, and now just multiplying these terms together we get some 16 pk to the l. So this, so now we've, uh, so this is the proof of the switching lemma. So this, what we're trying to prove is just this here and, and we have this. Okay, and by a more careful analysis you can get a better constant in this argument. Okay, so this is the... So where is the careful analysis? So where, where would you have need the careful analysis to get the okay. In the, how many one, how many elements we have? Um, well, for, for one thing, one thing we said p is at most one half. That was a bit lax, and I guess there's some other... If you look at uh, Hustad's original paper, there's a, he, he really gets, uh, pins down the constant in, in, in some uh, analytic expression, I guess. And okay. So, so finally, so, so it sort of remains to define how, how does this map work? How, how, do, how do we define this R star in terms of the R? And I'll, this part of the proof I'll, I'll go through a little bit quickly. Okay, so it's very mysterious. I mean, the first time you, you see it, it makes your head explode. Um, so, and it's not going to be important for the second half of the talk, but I just want to show it because it's, it's, uh, it's really neat. I, I tried to illustrate it. Okay, and the argument I'm going to present is, is, this, is, the, uh, is due to Razborov, but it's, a, it's essentially uh, similar to what goes on in uh, Hostad's proof. So, uh, so, what we're actually going to do is we're going to define a, an auxiliary uh, object here. So, instead of just mapping R to uh, some extension R star, we're going to map each bad restriction R to a pair, R star and some object code R. Okay, and this code R is going to live in the set, um, okay, so it's going to be two bits uh, and then an element of one decay to the L, so it's, it's some object here. So in particular, the important thing is that there are at most 4k to the L possible values that the code R can take. And then the second property is that this, the map from R to pairs R star code R is one to one. And it's easy to see that the, the, these properties 3 and 4 imply property 2. So the way we get this property 2, the, the fact that the, all we really need for the proof is that the map R to R star is 4k to the L to 1. The way we show this, or the way we define R star with this property is, is via this pair. So, uh, okay, so, and you can think of the code of R as being a recipe for inverting this, the function, you know, from, from, you know, given R star, given knowledge of R star, if I, if I then tell you what the code is in addition, then you can recover R. All right, so now let me show you how this definition uh, works. This won't be completely formal, but I'll just try to illustrate the, the ideas. Uh, okay, so let's, let's, in this example, we're going to fix, uh, let's say K is 3 and L is 4. So we have a 3 DNFF, okay, as follows, and let's let's say that we're going to look at this restriction, this particular restriction, which I claim is is going to be bad. So, um, so first of all, we we hit F with the restriction R, and it simplifies, and then we construct the canonical decision tree of of F restricted on R, and it looks like this. Okay, so this we saw, we saw how this construction works in the, in the beginning of the talk. Okay, and the claim is that R is in fact bad because this canonical decision tree has length uh, 4, which you can see here's a long path showing that the, this decision tree has length 4, uh, sorry, depth 4. Okay, so, um, so now I'm going to denote by R tilde here, I'm going to just append to this restriction R, I'm going to append this long path. So I'll denote this by R tilde. Okay, so this isn't R star, but it's, it's sort of an auxiliary object here we're defining. Okay, and 
our star is going to be this, and I'll explain how we, how we get this. So it's, it's, we're going to be changing the, so we have this long path, and all I'm going to do to get R star is I'm going to change the values that, that these extra um, variables on the long path get. And I'm going to change them in such a way that you'll be able to recover what R is given this. So note that we've set four additional, you know, we have the, you know, we set four additional variables so that that part is fulfilled. Now I just need to show you that if I give you this R star, I'll tell you how it's defined and, and tell you what this code is and show that you can now recover R, uh, given R star in the code. So let's kind of see how that works. So let me erase all these values here. Okay, just, just keep, remember what this long path is. And, okay, so, what, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at f restricted on r, and I'm going to find the first, claw, uh, the first uh, term here, which is alive, okay, which, which hasn't been set to a, to a constant. And in this case, it's <coughs> just this first term here, okay? So, and so now we're going to set these, these, the corresponding variables. So this is this blue clause, so these, this blue clause here, and we're going to set these variables in R star. And how do we do it? Well, we're going to set it in the unique way that satisfies this clause. Okay? So in this case, it would be x2 gets 1 and x3 gets 0. So, and that, that will be the, you know, that's how we fill in this, uh, this part of R star. Okay, now note that this is different, these values are different than the values on the long path. In the long path, you set x2 to 1 and x3 to 1. So, so we have a difference here. So now the, the code is going to say the following. At the, the first part of the code will, will say the following. You know, find the first satisfied term, this blue term, of f, f restricted on r star. So, so the point is that I haven't told you what, what the rest of r star is yet, but if I hit F with R star, it's going to have, you know, this term will be a 1. And we'll be able to see that because previously nothing, you know, nothing was set to a 1, otherwise we'd have depth 0. So when I, if I show you F restricted on R star, you can find this term now for yourself. And now I'm going to, the code will simply say, oh yeah, so, so forget about that, you know, you know, it will say look at X2 and X3 and set them to, to 1 and 1, not to 0 and 1. It will tell you how to get how to recover R tilde up to this point. Okay, so we want to, f the, the point is we want to find the long path so we can continue this process. Okay, and now it doesn't say this in English, it says it rather with this, with this code, right? And, and the point is how many bits do you need actually to, to express this? Well, you know, to s y you just need to say which point to the locations here where, where the variables that we're talking about, so maybe it says the second and the third, and say what the, what, the, what, the, uh, you know, what the assignment is. Okay, so it's not important. Now, how do we continue this process? So now what we're going to do is we're going to, at this point, we've sort of recovered the, we've recovered the first two bits of the long path. Now we're going to substitute them into, into this f, f, uh, f of r. Okay, uh, so we fix the variables according to the beginning of the long path here, and once again, we can simplify and now we'll look at, and now we, you know, we've moved down here in the, in the canonical decision tree. And now we're going to continue this process. So now the long path continues with x5, which is coming from this green term. Okay, so now we're going to say, how do we, how do we uh, fill in x5 here? So we do exactly the same thing now. We're going to set it in the way that satisfies this clause. Okay, so x5 is getting 1. Now in the long path, x5 is getting 0. Uh, so again, the code has to tell us how to get from here to here, and so the sort of next set of instructions in the code will say, uh, okay, now you've, you, you know, you've recovered R tilde so far, um, now sort of s take R tilde and, you know, you can overwrite this part of R with R star and then find the first satisfied clause, um, and now find this variable and set it according to the long path, okay. And now you just repeat this, this process till the end, and this is telling you, you know, altogether what the code is. So if you didn't get any of that, I mean, if, if this is the first time you're seeing this, it looks kind of crazy and it's, it's hard to, uh, it, it, it's somewhat unintuitive. So don't worry about it. The second part of the talk won't be relying on this, but I just wanted to show this argument. Okay, so the, and basically, so 
this code will be an object in here, but just think of it as being an, a, a set of instructions which says, given knowledge of R star and of course of F, here's a bunch of instructions which will let you recover R. And along the way you'll actually find the entire long path. Why, why do you use the two extra bits? Oh, uh, well, yeah, like the, so you could, you want to know um, when to stop reading. How many, how many bits, uh, uh, it was just to be safe, so yeah, you might not even need the two, two of them, but yeah, you want to say how many variables are, are being flipped. Uh, okay, all right, and now we can check that this, that, that this satisfies the, the, the requirements. So this R star has exactly L fewer stars than R, and by, con by construction this map from R to the pair is one to one. Okay, so that, that, that kind of completes the proof. All right, yeah, and so that's it for the, first, uh, for the first part of the talk. So after the break, I'll tell you about uh, a different approach. So I'm going to show a, a prove a much simpler, a weaker version of Hastad switching lemma. But this will have the property that it's, uh, it's very flexible. So I'll show that we can get switching lemma, which applies to uh, a much more general class of random restrictions. And in fact, restrictions which aren't subcubes, but which are uh, affine subsets of the hypercube. And this is, this is sort of a... Um, at the heart of this um, result in proof complexity, uh, this lower bound for the Cyton tautology on expanders. So that will be after the break. Uh, uh, any questions for this part of the talk? I have a general question. Can you explain again how we have named lower bound? So we pick a random stream, then we uh, make some transformations, uh, then we eliminate those circuits. Yeah. And where uh, does lower bound come from? Oh, great. Yeah, good question. So there's, there's a, two parts of it. So we have the random restriction, and we look at its action on the one hand on the circuit. So it gets, we get something which, is, which simplifies, maybe all the way to a constant. Now, on the other hand, to get a lower bound, we need a lower bound for a particular Boolean function. So we want to pick a function, so f such as the parity function, which has the property that under the same random restriction, the, the function remains com complex. So the parity function, w in order to kill it, to make it a constant, we need to set all of the variables. So if you show on the one hand that any small circuit becomes trivial, whereas your function stays non-trivial, then your circuit cannot be computing your function. So the, it's the combination of those two things that gives a lower bound. Any other question? Okay, so let's return at 11.30 for the second part.